Right here in chapter 6.3, we are going to talk about isolation, culture, and identification of viruses. So first let's talk about the isolation of viruses. And the reason that this is a topic is because if we think about bacteria, um, bacteria, we can just um, take a medium, take some nutrient broth or nutrient agar. We can put even a single bacteria cell in it, and as long as it has the appropriate growth medium, like a, just a typical nutrient growth medium, um, it can just go through the process of making copies and copies and copies of itself. And then we have lots and lots of bacteria. And then we can separate that out in various ways. <clears throat> um, and it's pretty straightforward. But recall that viruses are obligate intracellular organisms. Um, so this presents a little bit of a difference, um, a little bit of a difficulty when isolating different viruses because we can't just stick a single virus inside of a medium and then have it make many, many copies of itself and then uh, centrifuge it and, and have lots of viruses because they'll die because they don't have a cell because they have to live inside of a cell quote, live inside of a cell. Um, so when we isolate uh, viruses, we can do it in a couple ways. One, we need to grow host cells, right? So we need to grow host cells, right? Because if it's an obligate into intracellular organism, we have to have those cells for that to live inside of. So for example, if we're talking about a prophage or prophage, we can have an inoculum, so we can have a medium that we've inoculated with bacterial cells, we can grow the bacteria in there, and then we can add the virus, and then it can infect that bacteria cell or many bacteria cells, and then the virions will be released into the medium. Um, so we can grow host cells, and then our virions will be released into the medium. Right, because if we're talking about the lytic cycle, it's going to infest the, infect the bacterium, then it'll make many, many copies of itself, break out, burst, and then we'll have those virus particles inside of the medium. Of course, they'll be trying to find out or figure out where they're going next um, to the next cell and try to get itself in there, um, but we can isolate them because we can separate it from the medium by either centrifugation uh, or filtration. So step two would be the virus can be separated by centrifugation. Uh, so using centrifugal force, so you can put it inside um, of a centrifuge, inside of little test tubes, and then you can spin it very, very fast, and then we end up having a uh, little tiny test tube here that's going to have viral particles and then it'll have, you know, perhaps a layer of bacteria and then it'll have a layer of the medium, you know, whatever the medium is. So we can have the, the particles in there and then we can separate it out all the other parts and we can get our virus particles or virions. So centrifugation um, or filtration. And in filtration, then what we're talking about is we have to use specific membrane filters. Um, so membrane filters, and these membrane filters have to have a specific pore size. So our pore size that we're looking at is like 200 nanometers or 0 0.2 micrometers. Um, so the reason for this is because if we go up higher, so there's an, Im an image in your text um, where the filter pore size is 5 micrometers, and in this case, it's going to stop any larger cells, so eukaryotic cells, for example, would be caught in the filter, but what will be allowed through would be the medium and also bacteria and viruses in a 5 micrometer uh, pore size. Now then what we can use is a smaller pore size of the 200 nanometers or the 0.2 micrometers and then what that's going to do it's going to keep the bacteria separate and then it's only going to allow something that's so small as a virus to get through. So we have to use a very very small pore size membrane filter to get the virus through uh, while keeping everything else out uh, with the exception of the medium. Of course that's, that will go through as well the liquid. Uh, so that is isolation of viruses, so centrifugation or filtration. Then we're going to talk about culturing. 
Um, so again, when we're talking about culturing, uh, it's not like bacteria, like we mentioned, where we can just stick a bacterium in some medium or on some medium, and then it'll grow uh, either in the broth or on the agar. Uh, we have to think about how this is an obligate intracellular organism. So there are two different ways <clears throat> that we can grow something. We can culture something. Uh, one is called in vivo. So in vivo is when it's grown in a whole living or organism. In a whole living organism. So in vivo would be like inside of a person or inside of an embryo. Or there is in vitro. And in vitro is outside of an organism. But in cells grown in an artificial environment. So when we are talking about in vivo versus in vitro, you might have heard this when you read studies, scientific papers, for example. In vivo means a study that's been done inside of an actual organism. So if you think about um, things that are related to humans, if we're talking about in vivo, oftentimes we're talking about something that's been studied inside of an organism. So oftentimes it's going to be a rat um, that then they apply uh, to humans, or sometimes it's actual human studies, which is in vivo. In vitro is something that I often think of the, the way that I remember the difference between in vivo and in vitro is this T reminds me of test tube. Test tube is in vitro. So this is something that's outside of an organism. So inside of a test tube or inside of a, an agar plate, um, inside of something that's separate, that's not a whole organism. So in a culture flask or an agar plate. Um, so test tube is a placeholder, but that's with that T, it reminds me that in vitro is in a test tube, in vivo then must be actually in an organism. So we can grow viruses in vivo in a whole living organism or in vitro, <clears throat> but these can be kind of tricky. So when we are culturing things, for example, if we use bacteriophages, bacterio Phages. Remember that means it is a virus that infects a bacteria. What we often do is we grow what's called a bacteria lawn. Bacterial lawn. And a bacterial lawn is this really thick, dense layer of bacteria on an agar plate. So a dense layer of bacteria. Uh, so if we think of an agar plate... Then we have our agar in there. And when we have a bacterial lawn, we have this really thick layer of bacteria. And if we look down at the plate, what we really see is this incredibly thick layer of bacteria that has been grown over the entire plate. And sometimes we do this on purpose, uh, particularly if we're studying viruses. We absolutely do do this on purpose uh, for the purpose of studying viruses. So we will apply bacteria to the entire surface of the plate. We'll actually go in a zigzag motion over and over and over the plate and then turn the plate and go in a zigzag motion over and over and then turn the plate in a zigzag and turn the plate over and over again. And so then what this does is it creates a very, very thick or very dense layer of bacteria over the surface of the agar plate. Then what we have actually done is we apply this bacteria and virus solution um, to the agar plate. So really what we do is we grow an agar plate and the agar plate, whoops, let's bring that down. Sorry about that. The agar plate is grown with a more liquid type of agar. So it's a thinner agar, which is 0.7% agar. What we typically grow is a 0.5, or not grow, but make is a 0.5% agar. This is kind of the thicker agar that we use just to grow bacteria typically on the surface. Um, but with an agar plate that we're utilizing for a 
to detect for viruses, we'll do it in a 0.7% agar because it's a little bit thinner. And that being a little bit thinner means that when the bacterium is infected with the virus and it makes copies of itself and bursts out of the cell, it can move much easier through that agar um, to get to more bacteria. So we can determine if there is um, a viral infection um, because we then will have an area or many areas of dead cells. So in this agar plate, what we typically do is we start out with our, our test tube with medium in it, and then we have bacteria, and then what we do is we add the viruses to that bacteria plate, we stir it all up, and then we apply that solution to our bacteria, or to our agar plate with the 0.7% agar. And then again, we scrape it or you know spread it all over the entire surface over and over again, and then we incubate it. So what we've done is we have incubated the bacteria, but we've also incubated the bacteria with the virus, perhaps. So if we're not doing it in a laboratory, let's say this is just um, a solution of blood from somebody or um, of saliva or something like that, some sort of solution um, of urine maybe that we're trying to detect. So we take that solution and we place it on the agar plate and then we allow it to incubate. So what this is going to do is it's going to make it so that the bacteria are going to grow. So that's going to give us that bacterial lawn. But if there are actually um, virus particles, um, bacteriophages in there, then what we're going to see is clearings. Um, and these clearings are because we're not going to have live bacteria in that area. Instead, what's happened is it has killed those bacteria cells because they've gone through the lytic cycle where they have killed the bacteria. And so then we have these openings here where there is no bacteria growth because they've died. Um, and these are called plaques. So a plaque is a clear zone in a bacterial lawn. Um, it, it can be kind of cloudy, you know, because agar is kind of cloudy, but it's it's definitely a, a very clear clearing in the very thick, very creamy bacterial lawn. Um, so it's transparent, and then these are dead bacteria. And that tells us that then there were virus particles in there, and that those virus particles killed bacteria and then moved on and killed more bacteria. And so we have these plaques or these transparent dead areas. <clears throat> so that's how we can detect or, or culture and determine if virus is present in or with bacteriophages in bacteria. So now when we're talking about animal virus cultivation, in this case we usually use embryos. <clears throat> animal embryos. And in this case, you know, an embryo is an egg. And so oftentimes, um, particularly when we talk about things like vaccines, we're using things like hen's eggs, for example. <clears throat> and this is important um, for a couple of different reasons. So it's important for one, to identify pathogens. So in order to identify something that is infecting people, we want to be able to use uh, these animal embryos, because if it is something that's going to infect an animal, then we have to somehow cultivate it. We have to somehow grow it to be able to identify it. Um, so it's important for identifying pathogens if there is an outbreak, for example. Um, two, it's an imp it is important for producing vaccines. And we'll talk more about vaccines uh, more toward the end of the semester. Um, but vaccines, oftentimes, there, there are different types of vaccines, but a lot of them are dead viruses. So what we will do is we can make many copies of a virus inside of an animal embryo, and then we can kill off those viruses and put the particles in a vaccine that then is given to a person. Um, so they're used for identifying pathogens, they're used for producing vaccines, and then just kind of general research. Um, so determining um, characteristics of viruses, how they mutate, different things like that, how they affect things. Um, so they, it is important that we utilize these animal virus cultivation techniques so that we can do these different things. And then we also have to remember when we're doing this, however, that unlike bacteriophages, our animal viruses tend to have tissue tropism. So remember what tissue 
tropism is. What is tissue tropism? Only grows in certain tissue types. Right. So we have to make sure that we put this particular virus in the correct location. So incorrect location. Um, so the specific virus, if it's something that is only going to grow in, say, the nervous system, then it needs to be injected in that area inside of the animal embryo, for example. Uh, and there are different areas inside of the embryo that are mentioned. So there's the amniotic cavity that it can be injected into, uh, the chorioallantic membrane, and the yolk sac. Um, so there are the different areas that the virus can be injected, and then it's it has tissue tropism, so it's only going to grow in that area. So the certain virus we have to know, or we need to know, or we can test in number three here in research and see where it'll grow in those different areas. So that is in vivo, right? We said in vivo and in vitro. In this case, what we're talking about here is in vivo, right? Because we're talking about the whole organism. Inside of an embryo is an entire organism that's growing and then we inject the, the, vac um, the virus and then it's growing inside of the virus. Now we can talk about different ways to grow in vitro. So in vitro, remember, T is for test tube, so that's outside of a living organism. And we can do this by utilizing a cell culture. Now, when we are utilizing a cell culture, <clears throat> keep in mind that there are certain characteristics here that we have to be aware of. So, um, first of all, remember that bacteria cells, you can just add a bacteria cell to uh, a broth, you know, a liquid medium, and it can just be floating around and it's going to start making copies of itself. Eukaryotic cells are not like that. Um, eukary eukaryotic cells need to be attached to a surface in order for it to grow. Uh, it can't just be floating around like a bacteria cell. Um, and it also has what's called contact inhibition. So the first one is anchorage dependence. So when it has anchorage dependence, that means that it must be attached to a surface. And when I say it, what I'm saying is the eukaryotic cell. So we can't just take um, some cheek cells or an immune system cell um, and then stick it in a broth culture, let it swim around and make copies of itself like we do with bacteria. That doesn't work. It has to actually be adhered to or attached to a specific type of surface for it to function. And that's because of the way that it grows in the body. Right, We don't just have cells that are floating through our body, just appearing, um, and then just copying and making more. We actually have tissues um, in our body that are anchored to other tissues, and then they're reproducing, and then they're building off of those tissues. So we have anchorage dependence for eukaryotic cells, and then we also have something called contact inhibition that needs to be taken into consideration. Whoops. Inhi... And contact inhibition is needs to be taken into consideration because that means that there's a limited lifespan. Uh, and what that means is that as soon as, so say we do attach a eukary eukaryotic cell to a surface and it will make a copy of itself, right? That's going through mitosis. <clears throat> it goes through mitosis, makes another cell. That goes through mitosis, makes another cell. Um, so they're going through mitosis over and over again. And then it starts to come into contact with other cells because all these cells are going through mitosis and making copies. Um, contact inhibition is when a cell starts to touch another cell, so it contacts another cell via mitosis. It's making copies of itself. And then mitosis is triggered to stop. So mitosis is triggered to stop when a cell comes into contact with another cell. So this is contact inhibition. 
<clears throat> right? So if we have a cell, we put several cells in there, they're all going through mitosis. Then when they bump into another cell, they stop growing. And this is also a characteristic of eukaryotic cells inside of our body, right? So our liver cells, for example, um, they're undergoing mitosis, they're growing and growing and growing. But when they bump into another liver cell or when they bump into another cell, they stop growing. Uh, our our cells in our body, for example, our liver cell, isn't just going to keep growing and growing and growing and start pushing everything out of the way. That wouldn't work out for our bodies. Um, and so our cells have contact inhibition where once they bump into another cell, that's it. They're done. So we have to take these two things into consideration when we're doing in vitro studies or utilizing in vitro when we're talking about uh, eukaryotic cell viruses. So what we end up having is what's called a primary cell culture. <clears throat> primary cell culture. And typically our primary cell culture is made from fresh organs or tissues. So fresh organs or tissues. Oftentimes they um, take them and they grind up an organ, grind up a tissue, and they put it in some sort of um, flask that is going to allow them to grow. So it usually, they usually require attachment to a surface, just like we already spoke about with anchorage dependence. <clears throat> attachment to a surface um, because they have these attachment dependent mechanisms. And then also they have a limited lifespan, right? Because then they get too dense. So it's not really easy uh, to grow a primary cell culture, to grow a eukaryotic cell culture, because you really have to keep an eye on them. You can't just stick them in an incubator and let them grow, 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 because as soon as they, uh, um, as soon as they bump into another cell, then they stop, and then they run out of nutrients and they die. Um, so mitosis is going to stop because it gets too dense, or it'll bump into the, the edge of the agar plate, for example. It doesn't have to be another cell even. So um, what scientists will do is they start this primary cell culture with fresh organs or tissues, put it into um, like a flat bottom flask or a, an agar plate, and then they allow it to grow. Then what they do is once we get enough of these cells growing, then we transfer it to a secondary cell culture. And the secondary cell culture is where we have cells transferred from the primary cell culture <clears throat> and they've moved into the secondary cell culture. So we're talking about an agar plate. Let's say we take some cells from the primary cell culture that are kind of healthy, they're undergoing mitosis, they haven't had this contact inhibition happen yet where they stop and they start to die. We move them into the secondary cell culture. So we transfer them from the primary to the secondary. And then in this case what we do, because these are happy, healthy, um, metabolically active cells, then we periodically remove, wow, um, periodically uh, remove dead cells and we can add new medium. I can't talk and write at the same time right now. So periodically remove those dead cells um, so that we don't run into that contact inhibition problem. So we'll kind of get rid of some of the dead cells and add new medium. And the reason we have to add new medium is not only to keep the volume up, but also to continue adding nutrients. So we'll periodically remove uh, dead cells, and add new medium. And so then we have this secondary cell culture that we're going to try to keep alive. <clears throat> but then sometimes we need to go back to our primary cell culture or create a new primary cell culture, transfer those cells to make a secondary cell culture that's nice and healthy and happy, and then periodically remove those dead cells and add new medium as long as we can and try to keep them alive. Now, this can be a little bit tedious and a little bit difficult, um, and so we also have something that's called a continuous cell line. And a continuous cell line is just what its name implies. <clears throat> it's a cell um, or cells that are started and they don't have that anchorage dependence and or they don't have that contact inhibition. Um, so they have lost the anchorage dependence and or contact inhibition. 
And in this case, when we have continuous cell lines, the reason that they've lost this anchorage dependence and or contact inhibition is because they're usually from um, transformed cells or tumor cells. So usually from transformed cells or tumor cells. Um, so these are able to be subcultured many, many, many times. So subcultured many times. And they're not as finicky, right? You don't have to watch them. They don't have contact ambition. They can start growing all over each other. Um, and then you can take some and move them to a new agar plate. And then they can be left to grow all over each other again. Um, so, and the reason that these have lost this anchorage dependence and or the contact inhibition is because these are tumor cells. And tumor cells are cells that have some sort of adjustment or change in their DNA that makes it so that they don't have this contact inhibition. So these are cells that have lost those genes that are conferring contact inhibition or anchorage dependence, and so they kind of grow out of control, which is what a tumor is in the body, is that it's a cell that has had a change in its genetic makeup, and now it's growing out of control. It's no longer a normal cell. It doesn't have those same characteristics of a normal cell, which is bad when it comes to the body, but is good when we're talking about research. <clears throat> and I do um, recommend that you look into HeLa cells. Um, there's a bit in the text about it. Um, it's, in, it's an important story because the very first continuous cell line are HeLa cells, and the HeLa comes from Henrietta Lacks, um, who is the person that it came from, um, and it is because they are cells from her cervical cancer. And uh, these are the first cells, these are tumor cells, that uh, were taken uh, without her permission, which is why it's an interesting story. And <clears throat> this is the first continuous cell line where it grew out of control, and that's because, again, it's a tumor cell, so it doesn't have these same characteristics. Um, so I do recommend that you check that out in the text. It is an immortal cell line, which means that they're actually still using that cell line today. So even though it was the first cell line, um, it came from a really long time ago, I think like 1951, and they're still using that exact same cell line today because it hasn't died, because it just keeps growing and growing and growing. All right, so next we are going to talk about how we detect a virus. So detection of virus. So after we have isolated a virus, after we have cultivated a virus, then we want to uh, talk about detection of virus. So when we're talking about detection of virus, so we can talk about um, cultivation. So if we're talking about a, um, a research situation and we want to see if it's there, so if we have tried to cultivate a virus and we want to see if it's there. So for example, when you're talking about the embryo, right? And let's say we inject a particular virus into a different you know, a certain part of the embryo, and we want to see if it's available. We want to be able to de detect it. Or we can say we want to detect it in a patient, so in a blood sample, for example, or a sputum sample. Um, so if we want to try to detect the virus, there are various different ways that we can do that, and we're going to talk about those now. Uh, so first of all, <clears throat> when we have a cell that is infected with a virus, we have what are called cytopathic effects. Cytopathic effects. Also called CPEs. We don't need that apostrophe. <clears throat> so CPEs are uh, distinct observable cell abnormalities due to a viral infection. So distinct observable cell abnormalities due to a viral infection. So some examples of cytopathic effects are uh, loose attachment, because we're talking about um, anchorage dependence lost, for example. Um, these cells are going to be loosened up because they're no longer normal cells because they've been infected by a virus. Uh, so maybe loose attachment, um, a change in cell shape. So it's not going to be formed correctly. 
uh, nucleus, whoops, nucleus shrinkage. So we're going to have some sort of changes in the nucleus. Um, we can have vacuoles in the cytoplasm, uh, which are basically kind of little bubbles in the cytoplasm. Uh, fusion of membranes. And then we can have the formation of succincta and inclusion bodies, which are also oops, kind of um, other little bubbles uh, filled with various things. Or we can have just cell lysis, right? So if we think about something being infected with a virus, it can kill the cell, that's correct as well. <clears throat> So we have these different cytopathic effects. Uh, you don't need to know there's a table um, in your text, the cytopathic effects of specific viruses. You don't have to know exactly the cytopathic effect for the different viruses, um, but you do need to know what cytopathic effects are, and you also need to know um, some general examples of cytopathic effects, like the ones that I just gave. Um, so um, these are just different pathological changes. So these are something that pathology, um, people that are taking samples, looking at biopsies and things, would be looking for. Uh, these are the cytopathic effects. And it just depends, the different type of cytopathic effect depends on the type of virus that's involved. Um, so that's why there's a, a table in the text, but you don't need to know that. You just need to know what I've told you now. Um, so let's talk about some different ways to actually detect a virus um, with different research methods, um, and also different laboratory methods. So one are looking for these cytopathic effects. So taking a piece of tissue, like a biopsy of a tissue, and looking for these different cytopathic effects. Another way is through a hemagglutination assay. Hemagglutination assay. Hemagglutination assay. <clears throat> so a hemagglutination assay is a serological assay that's used to detect certain viruses in a patient's serum. So serological, or serum, is the kind of straw-colored liquid portion of blood plasma. So if you go to the doctor and they want to draw blood so that they can see if you are infected with the virus, they will take that blood, and that blood is made up of various parts. It's made up of your red blood cells. It's made up of your blood plasma or serum and your buffy coat, which is a bunch of enzymes and other things, <clears throat> white blood cells. So what we're talking about here is a serological assay used to detect certain viruses inpatient serum. <clears throat> so the serum is kind of the liquidy part of the blood plasm, plasma. So serum, again, uh, straw colored, oops, colored liquid fraction of blood plasma. in which the clotting factors have been removed. So that's also in the Buffy coat. <clears throat> so our serum, so we're taking the serum, so we take a patient's blood, we centrifuge it, and it separates it out into the different parts. We take the blood serum or the patient's serum, and then we can do this hemagglutination assay. Um, so a hemagglutination assay, heme is related to blood, and agglutination <clears throat> is clumping. Um, so in this case, what we're looking for is the clumping of red blood cells. So the clumping of our red blood cells are erythrocytes due to a virus. So some viruses produce hemagglutinins, which are different proteins that bind to the red blood cell membrane, and then it causes them to clump up. 
So that's what we're utilizing here. So some viruses produce hemagglutinins. Hemagglutinins, that's an I there. Hemagglutinins. And then hemagglutins are the proteins that bind to the red blood cells <clears throat> and cause cells to clump or agglutinate. So if we use the hemagglutination assay, <clears throat> what we are doing is we are taking a virus and the virus itself produces the hemagglutinins on its surface, those surface proteins, and if we add it to our red blood cells, then what we'll see is clumping <clears throat> if that virus, <clears throat> excuse me, if that virus is present, okay? So what we do again is we take the serum and then we're going to add it to some red blood cells. If we take the serum and add it to red blood cells, if we see no clumping, then what that means is that this serum has no viruses in it, right? Because it doesn't have the hemagglutinins and we don't have the clumping. Now, if we take the serum and we add it to red blood cells and we see clumping, of the red blood cells, then we know that this serum has viruses in it. And we know that it has viruses because it produces the hemagglutinins that are causing that clumping. Okay, so this is a way to take the serum. And what, remember, we've separated the serum from the red blood cells of the actual person. So in the laboratory, we're taking patient serum and we're adding fresh red blood cells to it and we're seeing if clumping happens. If it doesn't happen, then a virus is not present, a virus that makes hemagglutinins. If there is clumping, then a virus that makes hemagglutinins is present. Now, all that tells us is that there is a virus that makes hemagglutinins present. That doesn't tell us the very specific type of virus. If we then want to know what the very specific type of virus is, we can do an HAI assay. So an HAI assay <coughs> is a hemagglutination inhibition assay. So in this case, when we're talking about the hemagglutination inhibition assay, or HAI assay, what we are doing, it's an indirect assay. assay. So indirect assay for virus-specific antibodies. All right, so when we're talking about virus specific, right, what we're talking about is identifying the specific virus and antibodies are proteins that attach to a specific virus. Okay, so we can identify a specific pathogen. So it, I should say pathogen. Uh, in this case, we're talking about a virus, but it's pathogen in general. So we can use the hemagglutination inhibition assay, and then it is going to tell us what that specific virus is. So the way that that works <clears throat> is in this case, what we're doing is we are going to take the virus, or we're going to take, let's say what we're going to do is we're going to take the serum. Let's not say virus. We're going to take the serum, and we're going to add a specific antibody. So let's say um, this antibody is for virus A, uh, which means that this antibody is only going to attach to virus A, whatever that is. So what we're detecting in this serum is we want to say, hey, does this person have virus A? So we're going to take their serum, we're going to take an antibody that we know will attach to virus A. So we have, let's say, a virus, and then we have these antibodies, and these antibodies at this point here is where they're going to attach to the virus. And the way that they work is that they are going to attach to the virus and it coats the virus. So it's going to coat the virus, making it to where none of the other proteins on the virus are available. So we take the serum, the patient, and we add the antibody that's specific to the virus we're looking for. Then we're going to add red blood cells. Now, 
<clears throat> that we have those three things, if we see no clumping, then what that means is that these antibodies have coated the viruses, and so therefore it's not available to attach to the red blood cells and clump them. Okay, That means that the virus is present. If there is clumping, then that means that this antibody did not coat this virus, which means that this virus could cause clumping in the red blood cells, which means we don't have virus A, but maybe we have virus B or virus C or virus D, whatever it is. Um, so <clears throat> we can rule out virus A by this method. All right, so those are our hemagglutination assays. The next way that we can detect a particular virus is using nucleic acid test. So nucleic acid amplification tests, or NAAT. And the way that we use NAAT is to detect specific nucleic acid sequences. So for example, we can use PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. And what this is going to do, it will detect viral DNA in a patient's tissue or fluid. And this is because um, scientists have determined um, specific genes for specific viruses. And so then when you put the patient's tissue or, or patient's fluid inside of the PCR machine, you can add the certain things that you need, um, meaning the different um, primers and the different nucleic acids, um, which we're going to talk about in a later chapter. And what it does is it can amplify <clears throat> or make many copies of the viral DNA segment. And then we can use it to see what type of virus it is because the different DNA segments are going to be for specific viruses. So this tells us very directly. It gets right to the source saying, okay, we're going to make many, many copies of this, and then we're going to look at it and say, hey, that DNA only comes from this virus. So that's the virus. Uh, so we amplify DNA segment, uh, the viral DNA segment. Then use primer sequences to bind to viral DNA and identify it. So that's how we can identify what specific virus it's related to. And we'll talk about this in much more detail in future chapters when we talk about PCR and how we use PCR. Um, one other example of a nucleic acid amplification test is reverse transcriptase PCR. Um, so as you can imagine, this uses reverse transcriptase and then PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And in this case, what we do is we are detecting viral DNA. Detecting viral, I'm sorry, not DNA, RNA. We're detecting viral RNA. And the reason we're able to detect viral RNA is because, is because we're using that reverse transcriptase to make a copy of DNA from the viral RNA in the specimen. Um, and then what we can do is we can amplify or make many copies of that DNA copy um, by PCR. So in this case, we use the reverse transcriptase to make what's called cDNA, which is the copy of DNA um, from viral. It's actually complementary DNA, but... Uh, we're going to talk about that in a future chapter as well. From viral RNA in the specimen. And then the C DNA is then amplified. Amplified by PCR. 
And then again, we can use our different primer sequences to bind to that DNA and then identify it. <clears throat> and again, we're going to talk about nucleic acid amplification tests um, and PCR in general and, re and reverse transcriptase PCR in a future chapter. But you should know um, that this is a way to identify uh, viral DNA and therefore determine or detect specific viruses in somebody's sample, in a patient's sample. Um, another one, the last one we're going to talk about is enzyme immunoassay. E I A. So an enzyme immunoassay is using an enzyme um, and antibodies and how they attach to antigens. So it uses antibodies to detect and attach to specific antigens. So again, our antibodies, again, we're going to go into that in much more detail toward the end of the semester, but antibodies are little kind of Y-shaped things. And these little portions here at the end are specific. They're highly, highly specific. Um, so specific that they will only attach to specific antigens. And an antigen is going to be on the surface of a virus, for example. So we'll say that this portion of the antibody is going to attach to this specific virus portion and tell us that this is, for example, virus A, whatever that is. So we can use these antibodies to <clears throat> attach to the virus and see if it is there. The other piece of this is the enzyme piece. There is typically an enzyme attached to here that's colorless, and then when it is washed with a colorless solution, it turns into a specific color, and that tells us that it's present. Um, so let's take a closer look at that. So <clears throat> first what we do is we have a membrane, and on that membrane it actually has, um, I'm going to use kind of the same illustration that the text does. So it has these little spots on the membrane. These little spots are specific, so we would say that this is um, a virus A membrane. So then what we would do, and, and oftentimes they're little tiny um, little micro test tubes, but anyway, so we have a membrane, and then we take the person's fluid, let's say their blood sample, and we wash the membrane with it. So wash with sample. Now, when we wash it with the sample, what this does is that the virus, because it is specific for virus A, is going to attach to these spots. So if the person's sample has the virus, the virus will attach to these spots on the membrane. Okay, because this membrane was made specifically for that virus. So then what we can do is we can then use <clears throat> these specific antibodies, and these antibodies will have that enzyme attached. So what we do then is we wash with antibody. When we wash with the antibody, I'm going to draw it the way that your text does, even though antibodies don't attach this way, but we're just going to play along. <clears throat> and then on top of that, it has its enzyme. And these are made in a laboratory. So. We have the antibody that will attach to a specific virus. <clears throat> so then what we want to do is we want to know if this virus is present. Okay, so because at this point, right, all we've taken is a sample and we've put it on a, a membrane and then, you know, we've washed it away so it just looks like the membrane. Then what we've done is we've washed it with the antibody that has the enzyme and then we wash that away and it just looks like the membrane. We can't see anything at this point. What we then do is we use this enzyme here. This is the enzyme. We use this enzyme to have a reaction. Okay. So then what we do is we wash with a solution that then will react with the enzyme if it's present. So we wash it with the enzyme, and then molecules in the solution are going to fluoresce or change color. So this is the plain molecule, and then the solution is going to fluoresce, or it'll change color. And so now, rather than having a colorless solution, we have a blue solution. And we're going to do this in the laboratory. So 
So now we have a blue solution, which means the virus is present because we have the antibody that has the enzyme in it and it reacted. Now, if the virus wasn't present, right, so let's say we had another membrane and we added a person's sample, right, we washed it with the sample, and it didn't have the virus, so there's no virus here. <clears throat> okay, so it's been washed, there's no virus. Then when we add the antibody, right, it's not going to attach to anything because there's no virus there, it's not going to attach. So then this will get washed away. And so then when none of this is present, then when we add the solution here, with these little tiny molecules in it, then there's nothing for them to react with. There's no enzymes present because none of this stayed because there's no virus for them to attach to. So then this is not going to fluoresce, right? Because there's nothing to make it do that. So then this just washes away and then what's left is nothing. It just looks like the plain membrane. And so then we know that there is no virus present here, but since this is all blue, now this entire solution is blue, we know that the virus is present here. So that's an enzyme immunoassay. It's a very, very simple process. Um, so you just wash with the sample, wash with the antibody, wash with the solution, um, and then it'll change colors. And this is very, very easily done. And then the change in color just indicates that, that is present. Um, and then a person can do this many, many times over. So using the same sample, put it on another membrane with another antibody, with another solution. Does it change color? Does it fluoresce? Then yes, you have virus B. Or, or no, you don't have virus B. Now you have virus C. Um, so then what we can do after that is you can do this test. You can say, okay, that's present. <clears throat> then afterwards... Um, to be more specific, if you want to, then you can do the nucleic acid testing um, to confirm that this is true. So confirm or uh, be more specific. But this is very specific anyway, because it's talking about a specific antigen and a specific antibody. <clears throat> so immuno enzyme or enzyme immunoassays can um, be very, very useful uh, when we are trying to detect a virus. All right, so that is the end of the 6.3 section. Uh, we talked about different ways to detect, including the enzyme immunoassay, nucleic acid amplification test, uh, the hemagglutination assay, including the hemagglutination inhibition assay, so you should know the differences there. We talked about what cytopathic effects are. And then we talked about um, animal virus cultivation in vivo and in vitro. You should know all of that, including what a continuous or an immortal cell line is. I didn't mention that previously. Um, culturing, so again, in vivo and vitro, but talking about bacteriophages, the difference in agar plates, the 0.7 and the 1.5% agar. You should know what a plaque is and what that means. <clears throat> and then you should just know in general that we can grow host cells. The virion will be released into the medium. And then we can separate it either by centrifugation or filtration. And that depends on the pore size. <clears throat>